Right, 6.30, I'm going to start. Uh, so anybody who wants to come on camera, you can come on camera. Um, just mute yourself whilst I'm doing the presentation. If you want to bud, jump in, if you want to butt in at any point, then please do. Um, and then uh, we'll get into Q&A at the end. Uh, but I've got like a 15-minute presentation, 15, 20 minutes, and then we'll uh, have a conversation afterwards and more about the conversation. So let me, this is the big point. So first of all, I'm in Tampa Bay, Florida. Uh, this is my hotel room. That's my bed. I made it specifically for this session. Uh, you're very privileged. I'd never make a hotel bed. I just, I didn't, I couldn't bear the thought that the bed would not be made uh, if I did a online session. So the bed is made, the lights are on, we're ready to go. Let me share my screen. Window. Uh, and we're going to go with the Digital Circus Live 2022. So everybody can see this. Uh, no, you can't see it. Can you see it? Uh, right, let me press present. Right. If at any point you cannot see my slides, then please somebody jump on the mic and say, we can't see your slides. Uh, but this is the session, closing the unclosable buyer. Um, let's get straight into it. So here's the agenda for the workshop. Introductions, I'll give you a little bit about who I am. I'm going to tell you what the workshop objective is. Uh, specifically what's an unclosable buyer and then the five limiting beliefs which cause a buyer to be unclosable um, at the end we'll align we'll recap you just need to know five words basically and if you've got your notepad and pen if you've got your digital circus notepad just five words uh, and we'll go through those five limiting beliefs and then you can make notes underneath we'll align at the end and then we've got about 10 15 minutes uh, just to have a q a session um, but it is 06 30 in tampa bay florida uh, I was up at 4.30 this morning just to deliver this for you guys, just to see you guys on, on Digital Circus. So who am I? I'm Matt King. I'm the director and found, founder of Sales Change. Um, I uh, coach salespeople. I'm also a business leader. Uh, I run both the UK and the US arm of Safi Valves, hence why I'm in the US. Um, I've built successful sales teams and companies over the last 10 years. Uh, so, for example, Matt. Hello. Sorry yeah. to interrupt, you're not full screen yet, mate. You haven't given the full presentation view. You've just got the PowerPoint showing. Sorry to interrupt. That's the, this is what... Right, how do I do that? Because I can see it. Make sure when you share, you share probably um, just your screen rather than perhaps a program or something. How's that? No, you're still showing PowerPoint. Oh, when you go to share, make sure you share perhaps just your screen and you can go perhaps full screen. Ah, got you. Thank you, Adam. You are a star. Right, so let me share entire screen. Right, now if I click this and then click this, can you see the entire screen? Yes, that's perfect. All back to you, mate, off you go. Thank you, Adam, I appreciate that. This is what I was, this is what I was asking for, uh, interaction. Right, so yeah, I've built successful sales teams and companies over the last 10 years. So for example, Safi Valves in the UK and the US, we're 40% up on last year. Um, I've just promoted from within. We're continuing to grow, um, so I've got a little bit. Of, I've got a little bit of knowledge about how the sales process works and how sales work, um, both from a service-based business because that's what I do with Sales Change, but also from a product-led business. So I'm going to try and tailor the, the two today because I know we've got people like um, the founder of the Sock Company who opened up the Digital Circus, uh, and we've also got some service-based businesses. So bit about me uh my username has now changed on instagram i haven't updated the slide but um my username is now i'm matt king on instagram almost ten thousand followers in 10 months um and then built my sales change and my personal brand in less than a year also had a top 20 podcast and on the back of that top 20 podcast i presented three men and podcast with the one and only alan braithwaite and uh, ricky Locke. uh so the workshop objective is ultimately to give you guys more sales uh, and i thought being in the United States, I thought I would share a picture of a $1 note. Um, so every unclosable buyer is a reason for being unclosable. And there are five fundamental beliefs that you need to overcome to deliver that close. Now, I'm not going to give you fluffy one-line sentences that you can try and trot out to people so that you can try and close more sales. This is basically a follow-on from my 2021 Digital Circus workshop, which was the 2021 Sales Mindset. Um, so I'm not going to be asking you to question somebody's commitment, Try and open them up. Um, I'm not going to try and convince them to take out a loan so they can buy your product, all this type of stuff. 
if you do your job correctly, and these are the five beliefs that we're going to try and overcome in this session, um, and you handle the five key beliefs that we're going to go through, every shell should every sale should be less. You should have less objections within it. Um, so there are five uh, limiting beliefs. But first of all, what is an unclosable buyer? So an unclosable buyer is basically a buyer who you haven't closed yet. Um, that could be someone who follows you on social media, who has not yet pressed the purchase button. Um, and throughout this session, I'm going to reference wax melts because my wife runs a wax melt company. So um, an unclosable buyer for her would be somebody who follow her, follows her on social media, browses the website, but she ne hasn't necessarily pushed them so that they can close, uh, so that they can buy their product. And from a from my perspective, for a business for, for, of my size, um, so we turn over about two and a half million, um, the, the buyer would be somebody who has a need, has all these types of things, but they just haven't pressed the button to press buy. Uh, and that's ex essentially what I'm on about with an unclosable buyer. A buyer who, because of these five limiting beliefs, they have one or more of these limiting beliefs, which causes them to be unclosable. Uh, so let's get straight into it. The five key beliefs. So as we go through this, I want you to write down number one, which will be pain. Um, so this is the key belief that, that they need to they need to know that there is a problem. Essentially, um, if they've got holy socks, they need to buy socks. If they want their house to smell nice, they buy wax melts. If they want to sell more sales, they go to a uh, sales consultancy company, for example. In other words, if they're not aware of their pain, uh, you can't pitch to them and you can't make a sale. Um, so what I'm talking about is primarily for service-based businesses, but I also gave you the example of product-based businesses. So think of the hammer pictured here. Uh, there's a very old sales analogy regarding the hammer and uh, hanging a picture on a wall um, and the client doesn't need the hammer per se, they just want to hang the picture on the wall. So the, the pain point is the hanging the picture on the wall. It's the it's the the action that they need to to resolve. Um, so their may pa their pain may present as a problem that they didn't know they have. It's about generating that awareness through your social media content and through your sales outreach. And um, there was a lot of talk um, just on the previous session with the TikTok lady. Uh, I forget her name. Sorry. Um, regarding emails as well so you've got that email nurture campaign it's just about consistently identifying this pain point in your sales messaging in your social media content so that they they begin to subconsciously understand that there is a pain there and they need to have it solved it sounds obvious but there's a difference between somebody jumping on a call uh, to find out a little bit more info that's not that's not identifying the pain point that's them going through the discovery phase they need to be problem aware and they need to be in a genuine state of readiness to press the, the buy button. So if they're not aware of their pain or they don't believe they've got a pain point, uh, you're not going to make a sale. So again, I'm going to reference wax melts. If they don't know that their house doesn't smell nice, uh, they're not going to buy a wax melt to make their house smell nice. If they don't know that they need these funky socks, they're not going to buy these funky socks. If they don't know that they're not succeeding in their sales process, they're not going to go down a route of trying to get a sales coach. So number one is pain. If you haven't got the pain or if you haven't identified the pain within your buyer's journey, so we're talking about the buyer now, we're not talking about specifically uh, the people who are, uh, you're, you're not talking about yourself, you're trying to talk about your buyer's pain. So that's number one. Number two, and I'm rattling through these, so if at any point you want to jump in, I can't see you guys, so if you want to jump in and ask a question, please do. Number two is doubt. Um uh, the, the easiest thing to, to give an analogy for doubt is the fitness journey. So some people truly deeply believe that they're not going to lose that weight. They're not going to get fit. They're not going to get that six pack. So they're not going to generate the results uh, by working with a sales coach. They're not going to be able to afford to, uh, and you can fill in the blanks. So they believe they're incapable of getting to their end goal. Um, whether that's a nice home, lose the weight, achieve the perfect photo or anything else. We need to work on eliminating that doubt within their head. So you need to show off your social proof. So uh, a great way for this is testimonials, testimonials throughout your sales process. I see a lot of people, I follow a lot of coaches on, on Instagram consistently posting that their client has won X amount in by, by working with them for two or three weeks. Um, that social proof starts to eliminate that doubt. 
there's a there's a fine line there's a fine line to tread with doubt uh, and I'll come on to that in a minute but using testimonials is one way but using client photos for service based businesses so for example if you've sold your client or somebody's bought some of your product getting that client to take photos of that product that they are using and then using that on your own social media feed builds that sense of community but it, it also generates that social proof that other people are buying that product it's that fomo people want to see or, or people want to join that community people want to join that group so as soon as you start to post pictures of other people wearing that product other people riding that electric skateboard and i'm going to come on to this analogy in a minute um people want to want to join that community they want to feel that part of they want to eliminate that doubt in their mind that it is achievable this person's doing it or this person's doing it um you want to let them know that they can achieve x but there are certain obstacles they need to overcome which is why you are there so they want to have a nice home but they need to buy this wax mark in order to do that so this is what i mean about fine line you need to create that doubt create the fear that they're going to miss out but you need to give them the hope that they can afford it so whether that's through special offers discounts trial periods um if there's too much doubt they're not going to buy and if there's too little doubt they won't buy uh if there's if, if there's too little doubt for example in a service based business uh, they're going to believe that they can do it themselves. They, they they need to have this fine line between doubt. So this is your second limiting belief is doubt. Um, number three, desire. Um, so we need to quantify. And again, we're, we're talking about the buyer's perspective, not your own perspective. We It's very easy to think about desire from your own perspective and trying to generate that desire in your buyer's mind. But we need to genuinely sit in our clients' minds and create that desire. So instead of just losing weight or get healthier, to generate the desire, you need to know how much weight they need roughly and by and by when. And at what point will they feel their happiest? So for a product-based business, how much of that product do they want? How much do they need? And then how can you how can you give that to them in a ready-made package? It's, uh, working with my wife on her business, it's very now, it's easy for me to understand that actually when you're coming to a service-based business and I keep referencing the socks because I know that's a successful journey and it was talked about um, earlier on in, on the stage. How many socks go into a packet? How many socks do we sell? Um, and it's about creating that desire. So when it comes to health, uh, you, you, you talk about blood pressure, cholesterol, all of these types of things. You're quantifying and creating that desire within the client's mind. So essentially you're trying to, push for specifics um it's understanding their pain and how much pain they are in and i'm using the word pain obviously people aren't in pain with wanting their house to smell nice but it's it's quantifying the amount of pain so it's creating that desire in somebody's mind it's if the understanding of the pain and the di desire to fix it is strong uh they're going to buy they need to Pain and desire are two separate things. So pain is the specific problem they're trying to achieve, or they're trying to fix. And then desire is how much they actually want to fix that problem. So the pain is, I want a six pack. The desire needs to be there. So understanding the desire is, do they understand about their, their macronutrients? Do they understand about their daily calorie intake, for example? I'm using a fitness analogy because it's very easy. And that's why I put the chocolate there to, to prompt me. Um, if the pain is there, but the desire to fix it is low. So for, say, for example, I was fat and I wanted to lose weight. I, I didn't really feel like losing weight. Then again, you're not going to have the driving force or the desire to solve or buy that problem. So again, you've got to create the desire in your client's mind. You need to understand their pain points a little bit deeper. Just understanding that they need to lose weight or they need to have a nice smelling home you need to dig a little bit deeper. So the limiting belief is how much do they want to solve their pain problem? Obviously, understanding that they've got a pain problem is limiting belief number one. Number two is creating the doubt that they may or may not be able to succeed. And then number three is how much do they actually want to solve that pain problem? Uh, number four, support. Uh, I've put a craft beer keg for this because that's the only thing that's that supports me. I'm, I'm, I'm kidding, of course. Um, so I've labelled this one support so we can make a clear distinction away from price. 
Uh, price is obviously part of this support package um, so, because to go ahead with the purchase and commerce is a lot of things other than just price, but they need to be supported in their purchase choice. Uh, for example, if they don't have the money available, that's a lack of support. They're not going to be able to afford to buy your product or your service. Um, I've purposely listed this uh, as number four because price shouldn't be the driving factor for all of this. We should be able to identify the pain, the desire, and the doubt before we start having the price conversation. And this is this is what people often struggle with. If the desire, the pain point, and the doubt is there, they will buy. Um, they will find a way to buy. Uh, I, I can't see the screen, but I'm guessing most of us have iPhones. I mean, I've got my iPhone here, it's charging next to me. Um, the pain, the doubt and the desire to have an iPhone far outweighs me having a cheaper model, for example, Samsung. So regardless of price, I'm going to buy an iPhone. Uh, that's the perfect example that I can give where price doesn't necessarily have to be the driving factor in order to have that support. There is also another form of support. So for example, if you're about to attempt a, a fitness journey, you need to have the support of your family. So understanding, understanding your buyer's support network uh, I said I was going to come on to an analogy about my an electric skateboard. I very recently purchased an electric skateboard. I found a pain. I, I wanted an electric skateboard. I, I watched Casey Neistat blast up and down the streets of New York. I wanted to do that. I wanted to feel the wind in my hair. Um, I created the doubt in my mind. Oh, am I going to be able to achieve to do that? I've never ridden a skateboard before, but I could see people learning on YouTube. So I was, I was creating this, this fine line between doubt um, and then the desire was definitely there. I really wanted it. I, I, I started to research the research the models, research the, the feasibility of actually getting one to the UK. Uh, the support was, would my wife let me have one? Uh, and, and so if we take that analogy and I'm looking on the website and I'm looking at the, the buyer's journey, I've got the pain, I want to have the skateboard, I've got the doubt, will I be able to ride it? I don't know, it's an adventure. I've got the desire. So I'm, I'm, I'm pushing, I really want this skateboard. If my wife says no, that person isn't, I'm not going to click buy on the website. So you need to have that support network. And when we, especially in service-based businesses, if you're trying to find the person who presses the buy button, not necessarily the person that you're talking to, that's what we're talking about in terms of support. Um, the same is true for, for younger clients. I know we've just been talking about TikTok on the main stage, but if you've got, if you're primarily pitching to younger people, for example, they're going to need the support of their parents because they don't hold the purse strings. So it's, it's, a, it's better to handle this possible objection earlier and have the conversation about who's... Who, only you are going to understand your business model and how you can generate the support. But having the conversation earlier about whether they've got the authority to purchase, whether they've got enough funds to purchase, you don't want to go down the route of having multiple Zoom calls or, or DMs on social media if ultimately they haven't got the money to buy. And I've, I've been through that route myself. I've, I've reached out to online coaches. I've, I've worked with fitness coaches and I've fallen for the, they've identified the pain. They've sowed the doubt in my head that I need their help to manage that. I've got the desire. I want to lose weight. I want to get fit. I want to have the six pack while I ride my electric skateboard down Bournemouth promenade. All of that then falls down because they pitch their price at like 750 pounds a month the financial aspect should have, you should have that conversation early on, but the money doesn't necessarily, if I had 750 pounds, I'd, I'd probably say yes. So number four is support. And then the final key belief, and I'm conscious I've got like 10 minutes left, the final key belief, and this is probably the biggest one, is trust. Um, I said this at the last Digital Circus workshop that I did, um, you need to establish trust during the entire discovery phase. So when you're having the conversations on DM, every outreach, every interaction, every DM, every voice note, it needs to come from an authentic place. And we need to generate this, this no like trust. They need to know you, they need to like you, they need to trust you. Um, trust happens when you show that you're genuinely listening. And this is why bots don't work. So I don't know if there's any sessions on LinkedIn or anything coming up during the session, but I get a lot of DMs from bots on LinkedIn. And immediately the trust is gone because you can't generate that trust if you're not actively listening and you're not getting the response that you want. Uh, so take the electric skateboard example for again. So I've identified the pain. 
I've gone through uh, the uh, doubt, the desire. I've I've got the funds to buy. The, the skateboard that I actually bought was the third one I looked at because I went through their social proof. I went through the reviews. I went through how easy is it to service. I went through what is their customer service like. And then once you get to that stage, the board that I actually envisioned to myself riding, I didn't want anymore because I didn't trust the brand because how their customer service team reached out and supported people who had bought their boards, how how quickly they got their replacements, for, for example, for faulty boards. When I looked at the overall package, I, I started to find a brand that I could trust. So I worked with them, not the, my initial people that I looked at online. Um, so that, this is where it comes down to the, the, the company socials, the reviews on Google ratings, uh, YouTube videos on the subject. So if you've got advocates of your brand who are preaching about, and this is where it, building that customer um, desire and, and the doubt, can I show off my product? Can my customer show off my product online? without the need to have some sort of special caveats that you can't ride it at this certain speed, all this type of stuff. Once you uncover these five key beliefs, and we're going into the align phase now, so I'll, I've given you the five here. You've got the pain, the doubt, the desire, the support, and the trust. This is where all of the all of the um, objections that you you'd normally get in a sales process start to disappear. So pain, you've uncovered their problem. You've uncovered what the actual issue is. You've uncovered the doubt in their mind. You've treaded that fine line between can I solve it? Can I not solve it? You've created the desire because you've made it an attractive product. You know you un you know that they've got the support from their partner or you know that they've got support financially to, to close that sale. And then finally, you've built that trust with them. Once you've gone through that stage, if they know that the product's going to perform, if they know that you're going to perform from a sales coach perspective, they're going to get the results that they want because they've seen the social proof online. They've seen the testimonials. Once you're at that stage, all of the objections that you that you would think if you put yourself into the buyer's position, they're, they're going to dissipate. And this is where the objections become less and less. And it becomes more of a practical standpoint than it does of a mindset standpoint from the buyer's perspective. Uh, any questions? So there's my socials. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing so I can see the screen and I can see the chat because I like interacting with you guys. So let me do this and do this. Uh, if you want to come on screen, then come on screen. Um, Sheba, I've got the desire, but it's hard to push desire without pain points. It's not something people need and that isn't solving a problem. Yes. And, and so from your point, Sheba, and I know that you do the fancy, beautiful looking eggs. If you've got the eggs and you're showing them off, what you want to do is create that pain point that no wedding is complete without having one of these eggs or no occasion is complete without having one of these eggs. So it's about framing your social media messaging and your social media tone to show that actually there's a fear of missing out. This is the pain point that I'm creating. Uh, Fiona, I create artwork and home decor items. What would you say the pain points I'm trying to fill are? Uh, that you're creating that desire that you want your clients to have that your product. But if they, if again, it goes down to the same thing that Shiva, if they don't have your product, their home is not complete. So, and this is again, forcing that narrative into your buyer's head that your clients need your product so badly I, I, I follow a uh, an art brand on Instagram, uh, Ra, Raw and Rara in Bournemouth. I'm constantly seeing their pictures in artsy studios. I'm seeing them on walls of places that I would love to be at. And that creates the pain point in my mind that I want that. That's it's, it's, the, Again, pain and desire are intrinsically linked. You're creating the pain point that their life would not be complete without this. Their life that your sales process would not be complete without me working with you as a sales coach. It's about treading that fine line. Uh, Fiona put, uh, yes, Nicola. Hello. Matt, how do we um, do all this when it's B2B? Because the way things go at the moment, shops are closing at the rate of knots, e-commerce or bricks and mortar in, in, the sort of industry where I am, which is natural nail care and plastic free. Um, so I'm just wondering how do I flip that into a B2B scenario? B2B. 
because they like every, they normally buy a hundred bottles and now they're going down to only fifty, and they're taking longer and longer. And I'm like, hmm, got to keep them. Every business has a person within it. So the the phrase business to business is a little bit fraudulent in my mind. Um, and I take it's it's the most common way to reference a business selling to a business. But ultimately, you are selling to another person. So you can identify that person. And it's about identifying the specific buyer in that business and using them as the pawn and using them as the tool. Uh, without getting into too much detail, Nicola, I can't like go through a, a full sales breakdown. But yep. if you've got more people to sell to, and this is what we covered in 2021 sales mindset last year, if you've got more people to sell to, then you're going to have more sales at the end of it. Sales is a numbers game. However, if you're identifying the specific person within the company that you want to sell to, then that's the person that you need to identify. Uh, I don't like the how marketing people create this um, persona. It was in Zoe Hansen's podcasting session about she was talking to people when she presents her podcast. And when she presents her podcast, she pictures one person in her mind who she's talking to to make it personal. When you're pitching to your client, you need to be thinking of that one person, not it's very easy as a business to just send out the quote as a quote to another business. But think of the person who's receiving that quote. How can you go the extra mile to create that pain point or that desire or that doubt in their mind so that they buy more product? Um, so uh, I work for a B2B business. We sell thermoplastic valves to other companies so that they can install them in their chemical processes. For me to create a pain point would be that there's a global shortage of thermoplastic materials right now. You may not be able to generate or you may not be able to get these valves at the pace that you want them if you don't place the order now. So I'm creating that pain point in their mind using the global economic picture to showcase that actually there might be an issue. Uh, you need to act now. So yeah, that's no, great. that makes sense because I, from the global point of view, I am the only one that has this manufactured in the UK. Yeah. So well, then, and that's, and that's yeah, so perfect. to me, that's where I would double down and say, look, we manufacture this in the UK. There is a pain point here because I can't guarantee that. I, I don't know what your well, social. Just the fuel costs for yeah. deliveries and everything is going to go up if you buy it from Europe. Exactly. So that is creating cool. a pain point in your client's mind. Yeah. Um, when you start when you start thinking them, uh, of them as a person, uh, Al Fawcett is on this main stage at eleven. I don't know if you've got that announcement, but when you're creating this pain point in people's mind, um, it's much easier to start thinking of it from the yeah. buyer's perspective and saying, "Why should they buy? Why should they buy?" Yeah. Uh, Sophie Easton, great advice. Thank you. It's always important, also important to identify people's genuine pains rather than inventing problems that don't actually exist. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. Um, but we're not inventing the problem of the fuel shortage. There is a genuine fuel shortage, but we're just using that in a creative way to create a pain point which the client may need. Uh, so if, to, to elaborate on your point, the fifth key belief is trust. If, you, if you're not generating trust throughout the entire process, you're not going to, to create that sale. So it, key point number five kind of does that uh, and, and gets everything done. Uh, so I've got two minutes left. I don't know if anybody else has got any questions or are we all going to shoot off to the main stage and watch Al Fawcett? I, mean, I know I am. Uh, I'm the only one carving and decorating eggshells in a way that I am doing in the UK. Was that something I could add to my message? Yes. We So Safi Valves are the only thermoplastic valve manufacturer in the UK. We, we're the only person, we're the only people who manufacture thermoplastic valves in the UK. As soon as you become the only source of a product, You've got a, a, a market share. Apple, the only people who do iPhones. The only place you can buy an iPhone is Apple because it's their product. So there you go. Thank you, guys. That's how to close the unclosable buyer. And thank you, Adam, for sitting there uh, with all that going on. And thanks for jumping in. Uh, that's the end of my session. Thank you, Sheba. You are amazing, too. Uh, can I go back to bed now? Because it is now 7 a.m., in Tampa Bay, Florida. It's already about 30 degrees outside. Might just go in the pool. Anyway, see you later. <laughs> Bye, guys.